presentation is titled perm cat dysfunction when things go wrong so these are the three people who are responsible for me sitting here tonight so the first is dr inna rao my professor of medicine who always believed there was a nephrologist in me then dr sampath my teacher and uh, uh, my mentor so who introduced us to the uh, field of nephrology and groomed us into uh, taking control of catheters and uh, dr georgie nainan who always believed that nephrologists should do all interventions for ckd patients and who still believes in the same so uh, this is a seminal 19 uh, 99 article so this was termed the hemodialysis catheter conundrum we hate living with them but can't live without them so uh, the uh, issue was that uh, during that time in the us the majority were uh, starting dialysis on temporary catheters uh, but then they were having a lot of issues fistula was not being acceptable for a lot of them and so uh, then the others uh, means uh, they were quite upset that uh, uh, the tccs were uh, means uh, slowly taking over but much water has flown under the bridge after that time and nowadays we have come into accepting uh, tunnel catheters more and the longevity have improved and uh, the quality of life have become better so this is where uh, i started my journey this is from our publications in uh, uh, april 2011 indian journal of nephrology so that is me there so we started uh, putting uh, tunnel catheters in around 2007 so before we started it was the cardiothoracic people who used to do so it used to be a great show means they will take the patient to the op make a big nick in the neck they will do a venotomy blood will come gushing then they will put the catheter through the venotomy then they will do two stitches on either side and that catheter will continue to bleed for three or four days and then it will slowly settle then uh, uh, sambhat sir learned it somewhere and taught us and gradually our uh I means experience started and by 2010 we had around 100 uh, tunnel catheters and that number slowly started rising so we published this data in uh, 2011 indian journal of nephrology so before i start the uh, uh, going into the main body so this is a patient whom we had so it was a 85 year old male uh, so uh, who was initiated on hemodialysis four months back he was initially on femoral catheter then as the access failed he was started on jugular catheter then uh, uh, bilateral uh, av fistula were done uh, both uh, wrist and elbow and all failed and uh, he was continued on dialysis at a peripheral center he developed chills for previous two dialysis flow was poor was grossly grossly under dialyzed and he was referred to us for hd access so when we took up the patient so there was a, uh, the catheter was quite high so we all know that uh, quite often in peripheries either the physician or the uh, intensivist or the anesthetist put the catheter and they prefer to go high uh, so that they don't puncture the pleura so the catheter was quite high and uh, there was no flow at all and it was uh, uh, that uh, area around the catheter was thrombosed however the vein was uh, patent below so we took removed the catheter and uh, punctured the vein and uh, uh, this is the uh, x ray prior to putting the uh, converting to pom cat uh so uh, means we removed the catheter punctured the vein and everything went on smoothly and uh, this was the x ray after the perm cath so you can see that the curve is very nice the catheter is in the cardiac silhouette but when you aspirated there was no flow so this is a perm cath dysfunction now what are you going to do so we'll come to the case sheet uh, case later and uh, see what exactly happened so just an introduction about perm cath so perm cath or chronic hd catheter or cuff tunnel catheter or uh, means it is called by a variety of names so uh, this is uh, means one of the common modes of access what we have now so this is how it uh, differs from the acute catheter so in the west if you anticipate dialysis for more than 3 weeks uh, you straight away go into a chronic hd catheter and if it is acute uh, for 1 to 2 weeks then you go for a acute hd catheter so chronic hd catheters most are tunneled and uh, uh, most of them have a retention cuff and the tip is soft so whereas in case of an acute catheter it is a chronic conical tip uh, it is because it is quite easy but the other part is that uh, tip is quite stiff and it is quite easy to uh, perforate so uh, the uh, length is uh, I mean, purposefully kept short so that it does in the right atrium and cause a atrial puncture and uh, uh, you can have dual lumen or uh, triple lumen in case of uh, uh, i mean acute catheter and the venous port is 2 to 3 cm distal of the arterial port 
So uh, chronic, uh, you can you have multiple catheter designs. So you can have a staggered catheter, which almost resembles an acute HD catheter, or you can have a, a symmetrical tip design, or you can have a split tip design. And the material is quite different. So you have a polyurethane or silicone in case of acute catheter, whereas it is a thermoplastic polyurethane or a carbothane or a silicone catheter in case of a chronic HD catheter. And the chronic HD catheters are quite soft, so that even if it goes into right atrium, the chances of perforation is uh, lesser compared to that of an acute catheter. So this is the classical permacare. So if you look at the split section, you can see that uh, it is quite thick and it had two different lumens. So since this was the first chronic HD catheter to come into the market, the name permacath stuck. And uh, uh, nowadays, all uh, means chronic HD catheters are, as a generic term, referred to as a permacath. So then came Tessio catheter. So these were two individual uh, lumens. And then came Vascath. So here, what they found out that, so you can reduce the wall in between and you can make it more compact so that the chances of uh, uh, means uh, thrombosis or fibrin sheath is lesser. So these are the various designs. So this is the earlier uh, uh, catheter what you had. So this is the staggered tip design. And a typical example is the Maxit catheter. So you have what is known as a tip to cuff length. So this is what we commonly refer to. Then you have a, a, a tip to hub length. Then uh, uh, you have two hubs. Then you have a conical uh, tip. And then you have a fibrin cuff. You have a cuff over here. So this is usually uh, made composed of Dacron. So what it does is uh, it causes an intense inflammation around that and uh, it uh, fixes the catheter to the anterior chest wall. So the chances of it getting dislodged and theoretically the chances of transmigration is lesser. So uh, then you have the symmetrical tip. So this is the palindrome tip. So you have uh, laser cut and square side holes. So uh, this is the barred, uh, I think, light path. So you have a, a central hole and then you have two symmetrical cut designs and then uh, multiple side holes. And uh, this is the uh, arrow vector flow. So you have, uh, again, a symmetrical tip with the uh, two side flows. So this is a hemophilic. So you have uh, two different uh, split ends. So advantage is that these are uh, means uh, uh, far apart. And the chances of uh, uh, means uh, recirculation is theoretically much less compared to the other catheters. Then you have anti-grade catheters and you have retrograde catheters. But for practical purposes, both are more or less the same. So this is another uh, means regarding uh, uh, other, uh, means another slide illustrating the various tip designs. So this is a split tip with preformed uh, curved tips, a standard split tip. Then you have a, a, a step tip or a staggered design. Then a symmetrical tip with uh, uh, side holes. Then you have a dual catheters. Both are separate, and uh, you insert both of them differently. So what is a catheter dysfunction or what is catheter malfunction? So this was first defined in the 2006. KDOKI guidelines. But wh what happened was that uh, there were a number of criteria and ultimately it was quite complicated. So KDOKI in 2019, it uh, simplified into uh, uh, this definition. So in uh, they defined CVC malfunction as failure to maintain the prescribed extracorporeal blood flow required for adequate hemodialysis without lengthening the prescribed HD treatment. Uh, uh, so uh, the consequence, what are the consequences of uh, catheter dysfunction or malfunction? Uh, the first and foremost is the dialysis becomes inadequate because you have inadequate flow, you have inadequate clearances, and uh, the uh, quite often the duration gets shortened down. So uh, the dialysis becomes inadequate. So once the dialysis becomes inadequate, then uremic toxins start accumulating and the patient's death becomes uh, uremic and the quality of life becomes poor. Because of the uremia, the patients will have multiple hospitalizations and because of the manipulations, the patients tend to develop multiple infections. So ultimately, due to hospitalizations and because of the infections and because of the other issues, the cost goes up. So ultimately leading to morbidity and even mortality. So that's why we should be very careful about catheter dysfunction or catheter malfunction. So another way of classifying is a complete or a incomplete uh, catheter dysfunction. An incomplete catheter dysfunction in which, in which the catheter runs for some time, but then suddenly it stops. And then uh, it refuses to uh, start. But once you start after installing heparin or uh, bicarbonate, then after some time it starts. And again, the same process continues. Complete is in which you attempt uh, to start the dialysis, but then there is no flow or there is very poor flow. And dialysis uh, doesn't happen or happens, uh, I mean, very substandard ways. Then you have uh, immediate or late complications. The immediate uh, complications are the first and foremost is malposition. Catheter can go anywhere within the thoracic cavity uh, so uh, or uh, within the abdomen in case of a 
means uh, femoral palm cap. So you can have multiple kinks. So you can have a, a thrombus formation also. So these are the immediate complications. So late complications include fibrin sheath, thrombi, central venous stenosis, malposition, fracture, etc. So uh, these are a few examples. So if you look at this catheter, so you can see that the catheter uh, tip is uh, not inside the RA or not even in the junction. And if you look at the uh, outside uh, means length, it is much more. So this is a catheter which has been pulled out. So this is a malposition. So if you look at this catheter, you can see that there is a kink at the entry point. So uh, this usually happens when you try to make a small incision at the neck. So what we can do, do to avoid this is take a more wider uh, incision and take a wider cu uh, curve so that this doesn't happen. So another reason for this is uh, there might be a tight band between the vein and the uh, superficial tissue. So quite often you will have to remove the catheter a bit, then uh, tighten the band. Small kinks can be usually ironed out uh, due to the uh, when the catheter starts running. But if it is such significant kink as this, then you need to uh, uh, means remove the sutures there and then uh, uh, make the uh, curve better. So this is another example uh, of a malpus. This is not a, a tunnel catheter, but uh, this is something which is enough to stop your heart. So this is catheter which went into a venous malposition. So uh, ultimately, we did the contrast study, found out that it was in the vein, removed it and uh, put it into the uh, uh, means uh, 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 SVC. So this is another thing. You can see a small kink over here. So for this kink, we didn't do anything. So this uh, uh, means it got ironed out by its own after two to three sessions of dialysis. So what can you do to prevent immediate complications? So first and foremost is to, uh, do USG guided punctures. Uh, because now was not, you have ultrasound machines everywhere. You have machines in the ICU. You have machines in the ER. Uh, you have machines everywhere. So try to do ultrasound guided punctures as much as possible. Then uh, try to do the procedures, procedures fluoroscopy guided. Uh, a lot of us uh, even now do it on the bedside. But uh, uh, means uh, fluoroscopy guided can ha uh, can will have its own advantages. Then uh, if you find that if the patient has been on a long-term uh, catheter and if the uh, catheter is uh, uh, temporary catheter is not working well, you can try on the opposite side if the guide wire is not going or you can puncture at a different area or uh, you can try uh, interventions. Again, curves matter. Uh, uh, short, acute curve can have problems. So you need a uh, wide, smooth curve so that the catheter functions well. So next we will come to the long-term complications. So the first and foremost is the fibrin sheath. So uh, this is the pathophysiology of a fibrin sheath uh, around a tunnel uh, catheter. So uh, when the catheter is uh, exposed to the blood, so there is a protein layer about 100 nanometer that is composed of fibrinogen, albumin, gamma globulin, uh, lipoproteins and coagulation factors. And uh, albumin can counteract these coagulation uh, effects, but it activates the intrinsic protein uh, pathway that converts fibrinogen into fibrin. So ultimately, this fibrin uh, deposits and ultimately collagen forms, which deposits along the length of the catheter. So what happens is uh, within a period of, of uh, weeks to months, the smooth muscle cells from the venous ward, they move towards the intimate layer. And uh, ultimately, this gets deposited along the length of the catheter. So what this happens is uh, this will deposit uh, uh, around the uh, I mean, uh, around the venous or around the tip of the catheter and this will act as a valve. That is, uh, it will allow you to push uh, uh, means fluids or push uh, means blood into the lumen. But uh, once you start aspirating, then it will uh, adhere to the tip and then the flow of the blood get, gets restricted. So this is a catheter which we removed recently. So this is a lady who has been on dialysis through with the perm cath for about six to eight months. If you look at the uh, tip, you can see that it is quite uh, yellow and uh, uh, it is yellowish green. So this was an infected catheter. So we removed the catheter. So this is the beginning of a, a fibrin sheath over there. So when we tried to manipulate uh, the other caught uh, uh, tone, so uh, we were managed to salvage only this much. So uh, this fibrin sheath gradually grows and extends till the end of the catheter. So uh, fibrin sheath is present in up to 57% of chronic HD catheters when they analyzed catheters which were removed. And it can uh, start as much as 24 hours uh, within insertion. So suppose you are uh, suspecting a fibrin sheath. So uh, means uh, what can you do? So one is you can try local thrombolysis with uh, urokinase or alteplase. 
Uh, you can try changing the catheter over a guide wire and put a new catheter. So once you remove the catheter, then uh, uh, hopefully the fibrin sheath might also come out. But sometimes the fibrin sheath won't come out and it will remain there and the new catheter will also have its own problems. So what you can do in such cases is you can uh, put a, a snare from the uh, through the femoral axis. So get it to the uh, around the catheter and then remove the fibrin sheath with the snare. So the next common uh, issue what we call, uh, encounter is thrombosis. So the thrombosis and fibrin sheath, the mechanisms are uh, slight are similar, but then there are uh, uh, differences also. The similarities are both uh, are triggered by insertion site damage. So both will are due to blood material interaction. So you are uh, putting a foreign body into the vein and it will interact the blood and ultimately these interactions take the toll on the uh, catheter. And uh, uh, there is effect in effect of change in shear stress and uh, uh, depending on the type of the catheter. And in both you have infiltration of smooth muscle cells, collagen and endothelial cells. So the differences are thrombus can form both inside and outside the catheter tip and thrombus can form inside the catheter as well. There is involvement of the inflammatory cells in case of a thrombosis. So uh, in case of a fibrin sheath, it forms uh, outside along the whole catheter leading to a flap valve effect. That is what I told you. So you'll be able to uh, push in fluid or blood, but uh, you won't be able to aspirate the blood. So there will be a contact between albumin and coagulation factors, which convert fibrinogen to fibrin, so which is not there in case of a thrombosis. So uh, these are the, uh, uh, means, uh, uh, the risk factors for thrombosis in uh, tunnel catheters. So uh, one is the catheter related factors. So these include catheter caliber to weight ratio. So you have a larger catheter in a smaller vein, then the chances of a thrombosis is more. If you have a very traumatic vein puncture, again, chance of a thrombosis is more. Catheter tip location is important. So if your catheter is very much into the SVC and it is not uh, beyond the SVC RA junction, then your chance of developing a thrombosis is more. That's why nowadays you uh, means recommend putting the catheter slightly into the right atria. Then the patient related factors are the central vein lumen diameter. So if you have a smaller central vein, the chances of thrombosis is more. If there is a history of thromboembolism, we see that there are multiple uh, patients who develop all this. And if you take a past history, uh, they have history of some thrombotic event in the past. So you put them on a small uh, anticoagulation, they do very well and they don't usually develop problems. So the other comorbidities include malignancy, uh, so which is quite often a pseudo a, a thrombotic uh, state. Then if there's a congestive uh, cardiac failure, again, there are chances of developing thrombus. Hypercoagulable state, again, uh, uh, means you can develop thrombi. Immobilization is another uh, risk factor for thrombi. And uh, hemodialysis induced factors include hypotension, venous stasis secondary to volume depletion. So this can also uh, means uh, 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 means uh, pre, uh, means uh, tend to develop uh, thrombosis. So this is how thrombus develops. So whenever there is a catheter insertion, there is damage to the vessel wall at the access site, and there is activation of the coagulation and inflammatory response uh, cascades. Then a soft thrombus is uh, formed at or within the catheter tip. And it can uh, occur inside the catheter as well. And ultimately, a fibrin forms within the surface of the thrombogenic catheter. And uh, uh, infiltration can start. Ultimately, uh, there can be a vascularized connective tissue, which can lead to heart thrombus, and uh, which ultimately leads to catheter failure. And you'll need to remove the catheter. So how do you uh, treat it? So if it is an acute thrombus, what you're suspecting, you can try installing heparin or a mixture of uh, heparin and sodium bicarbonate. So quite often, you'll be able to Success And once uh, you are able to open up the catheter, you can uh, give a good dialysis with a full dose or a slightly more dose of heparin and then anticoagulate them for uh, some time. And then uh, if there are no events, you might even consider stopping anticoagulation or keep them on a low dose anticoagulation. Then what you can do is uh, thrombolysis, do thrombolysis. Uh, earlier, urokinase was not available, but nowadays it has come into the market again. Streptokinase is the classical drug which has been used, but then uh, the dosage what you use and what you get is uh, quite different and uh, uh, means what we have seen is uh, patients can develop reactions or patients can develop arrhythmias with streptokinase, which is not there with uh, urokinase. And the prevention is you need to anticoagulate the patients, I means you need to lock the catheters properly. So you have multiple locking solutions. So you can use either heparin or you can use heparin with the uh, antibiotic solution or you can use uh, uh, citrate solution so which can help in the prevention but ultimately you need to make sure that 
you are using the proper volume uh, to lock the catheter. Otherwise, the patient, uh, otherwise the catheter uh, can get thrombosed. So these are the various locking solutions available. You have heparin, alteplase, and urokinase. These are not used as uh, locking solutions now. So you have citrate, which has got anti antimicrobial properties as well. So heparin, citrate, and sodium bicarbonate along plus or minus the antimicrobial agent is the locking solution which we use now. So, uh, but uh, anticoagulation can have its uh, share of problems. So this is a lady whom we uh, thrombolyzed with uh, streptokinase because at that time it was not available. After a few days, she developed uh, pain uh, in her uh, uh, left side of the abdomen. So when we did the CT, we found out that there was a psoas abscess over there. So it was conservatively managed, managed and the uh, patient improved late. So next is what we commonly see is catheter infections. So catheter infections are one of the most common uh, things that we see and one of the reasons why pump cats get removed quite early. So these are the risk factors for catheter-related infections. The bacteria-related factors include bacterial virulence and formation of a biofilm. So whenever you put a catheter, there will be a slimy layer inside the catheter. So it is called a biofilm. Quite often bacteria can get trapped and ultimately this can lead to infection. And uh, uh, the common causes of, uh, there are three main routes of infection. So one route is through the hub. That is, if you don't uh, uh, treat the catheters properly through the hub, we can, the bacteria can go inside the catheter and go inside the bloodstream. So another route is uh, bacteria somewhere from the body uh, can come via the bloodstream and get deposited on the catheter. The third reason, uh, the third route is the transmigration through the exit, uh, I means through the exit site, it can transfer uh, via the tunnel and get into the catheter. So the patient-related factors are an impaired immunity, especially uh, diabetes, uh, malignancies, et cetera, and uh, a prior history of catheter-related bacteremia. So this occurs, uh, our patient is uh, uh, prone to that because uh, he has had a CRBSI. He has had a, a multiple chills and rigors. So unless you load them him with antibiotic and then put the catheter, there are chances that the patient might develop a, a catheter-related bacteremia. And the hemodialysis procedure related factors include long-term use of catheter, frequent manipulation of catheter, especially if there is a thrombus, and then you are manipulating the catheter quite often, the bacteria can get deposited into the thrombus and become a nidus of infection. Catheter hub colonization. So especially if you don't lock the catheters properly, and if you don't clean the catheter hubs properly, you can have a catheter hub, hub colonization. Skin and nasal colonization is another uh, factor for infection. So if the patient is getting frequent uh, infections and uh, if there are uh, means if you are not finding any uh, cause then uh, you, you can do skin and nasal swabs and see whether there are any uh, colonizations there. So catheter infections are quite common. In the US you have around 250,000 to 5 lakh episodes a year leading to significant cost and significant morbidity. So you can have procedure related risk factors like uh, frequent dialyzer reuse then uh, poor quality water uh, or insertion related issues, etc. So, which can be tackled if your dialysis unit is good. So, ultimately, it leads to catheter dysfunctions and adequate hemodialysis. Antibiotic locking solutions help, but then uh, there is always a other side that if you don't do the proper volume locking, the antibiotic can get into the system. And uh, gentamicin is the most commonly used antibiotic, and uh, it can theoretically go into the system and it might. And if the patient develops a deafness, the patient can always blame it on you. So if the catheter infection is severe, uh, the removal might be required. So uh, this is another interesting patient. So this patient uh, came to us. So uh, he was uh, initiated on dialysis. He had a huge lump on his neck for which he was not willing to do anything. So he was on a temporary catheter for about two to three months. He was not willing for a tunnel catheter initially, though he had poor weights, he wanted to take the chance. So, uh, and uh, he underwent the fistula, fistula failed. And uh, uh, this is the problem with the converting delayed uh, means uh, catheters because there is epithelization of the uh, means edges of the uh, temporary catheter and uh, sometimes it doesn't heal. And uh, the problem with him was his neck was short and uh, uh, because of this large uh, mass over here, there was not enough space to uh, means manipulate the catheter. So unfortunately we had to uh, convert his uh, temporary catheter into a tunnel catheter. And uh, we uh, did a proper secondary suturing, but this fellow vanished to some other place because he was getting uh, means low cost dialysis there and came back after five months with one episode of fever and some discharge from the uh, tunnel. 
So when we looked at that, there was nothing. This tunnel had properly epithelized and uh, uh, means uh, there was no point in manipulating this then because uh, it was epithelized and there was uh, uh, again manipulating it uh, will uh, lead to more morbidity than um, do good for him. And after uh, three to four months, he developed multiple episodes of CRBSA and ultimately this catheter had to be removed. So coming to central venous stenosis. So this is another thing what we commonly encounter. So uh, central venous stenosis happens in a lot of uh, tunnel catheters. So what happens is after endothelial, uh, uh, there is an endothelial damage after vein cannulation and there is change of uh, uh, shear stress and there is intravascular thrombosis and vein remodeling. Alongside there is thrombin generation, platelet activation, inflammatory response. And this catheter is not a static entity. So whenever you uh, breathe or whenever you turn your head or whenever there are changes in position, this catheter moves and this uh, rubs against the vein. So ultimately this causes inflammatory process and uh, uh, there is a deposition of uh, platelets and there is a venous wall modeling. So ultimately there is a central venous stenosis. So uh, this is one patient who had a, uh, whom we had to remove a perm cap. They did a, a vein, uh, they did a AV fistula, a fistula was working, but then fistula failed and he wanted to do a repeat perm cap. So uh, uh, when we uh, initially we tried it on the bedside. So when we, we put the catheter, it was not going through. So this is the X-ray. So you can see that the guide wire is getting coiled over here. So there is an obstruction somewhere over here. That is the reason why the guide wire is getting coiled. And uh, the clinical manifestations of central venous stenosis are quite often there will not be anything. You can have a facial puffiness, you can have arm edema. So remedies are if there are no symptoms, you leave it alone. You don't do anything because quite often you can have multiple collaterals which uh, will take care of the venous return. But uh, if the patient is symptomatic or if you want to put a catheter and uh, it is not going in, what you can do is you can do a central vein dilatation and then put the catheter in the same sitting. But it is not uh, means uh, safe because uh, you can have, sorry. So uh, you can have complications of uh, this as well. So uh, this is uh, one patient uh, who, uh, uh, means underwent uh, who had a uh, means uh, AV, AV fistula, initial perm cath on the left side. Then they did the AV fistula. Then she started developing uh, swelling of the left hand. So what the interventional radiologist did was uh, do a uh, central venous uh, uh, dilatation. So after one week, she presented to us with severe breathlessness. So if you look at the X-ray over here, so you can see that there is a slight uh, bulging over the left side and uh, this is more or less straight. So we did the CT and what we uh, saw in the CT was that there was an anterior mediastinal hematoma over there. So the vein had, uh, uh, there was a tear in the vein during the uh, uh, central, during the dilatation. So maybe because it was a small tear, it was missed. And the patient had continued bleeding, leading on to severe anemia, ultimately developed breathlessness. But fortunately, it was, uh, 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 means it was, uh, uh, means self-contained and there was no worsening. So we left it alone. So these are the things what can be done for a, a central venous stenosis. So, so this is an angiogram. So if you look at that, so you can see the stenotic segment over here. So uh, this is how you get across the stenosis. So we are passing a guide wire through the this thing. So here, uh, quite easily, we were able to pass through. So after we uh, pass the, uh, uh, means uh, get across the lesion. So what we can do is pass a balloon and then inflate it and then do the dilatation. So after that, uh, uh, we have slowly dilated and put the sheath. So after that, so, so this is the catheter after uh, insertion. So you can see that there is a nice curve and it has been positioned correctly.
So let us come back to our case. So, uh, so I think, yeah, so uh, this is the X-ray. So we have put the catheter. So uh, this is the X-ray after that, but there is no flow. So what are you going to do? So what next? So I think anybody? So what we did was, uh, means uh, you cannot pull out the catheter because it might be a malposition. So what we did was we uh, took the patient to the uh, for an emergency CT. So so this is the video of the CT. Okay, so this is the CT. So you can see the pump cat coming over here. So this is in the vein. Okay. You can see that the catheter is in the vein, but then you can see that here, somewhere over here, the catheter is breaching the uh, vein, the brachiocephalic trunk. Yeah, and it has breached and it is going along the pleura. Yeah, and it has gone along the pleura and uh, settled in the lower pleural space. Okay, so, so this is the CT. Uh, the other view. So you can see that it has entered the vein. So it has uh, gone out of the vein and then gone into the pleural cavity. So there, you can see that there is a small thrombus also at the uh, level of the breach. So this is the reconstruction. So you can see the catheter over here. From the vein, it has gone inside into the pleural space. So I think this is enough to stop anybody's heart. So thankfully, the patient was hemodynamically stable. He was maintaining his saturation. So what do you do next? So uh, you are totally freaked out. So what are you going to do? So uh, uh, so what we did was, so we uh, got a, a cardiothoracic and surgical opinion. Basically, there are two types of management. So you can, uh, the what has been commonly described in the books and in the journals is you call the cardiothoracic, do a thoracotomy and do the, remove the catheter. But this is the 85-year-old male, a week, had a recent uh, a CRBSI. Uh, and uh, uh, the cardiothoracic surgeon opined that doing a thoracotomy for a suture is too gross. So why don't you consult a cardiology? So we uh, asked our cardiologist and uh, we decided to go in the, uh, uh, go in uh, means this thing wise. So this is what we did. Okay, so what we did was we uh, means uh, first entered through the femoral route, then uh, got a guide wire across into the right subclavian vein. So this is to anchor the guiding catheter and to anchor the balloon. Then after that, then after that we made sure that uh, we put a catheter across and made sure that the catheter was in the uh was in the pos in position okay. 
So after that, we put a, a guide wire into the uh, means into the catheter and then pulled out the catheter. So after that, uh, from the earlier guide wire, a balloon was uh, introduced. So what we used was a peripheral arterial balloon. So it was a 20 millimeter tasselic balloon. So you can use a mammoth balloon or some other uh, peripheral balloon. And then we uh, inflated the catheter, uh, inflated the balloon and kept it in place for about 10 minutes. So what happens is when you keep over there, what we are doing is a tamponade over there and the thrombus formation will be there. And because it is a vein, usually the clot will hold. So this is the balloon which has been fully deployed. So after that, so we injected the contrast to see whether there is any leakage or not. So right now you can see that there is hardly any leak over there. So then we what we did was we pulled out the guide wire and then again uh, gave a, a balloon terminate for another 10 minutes. And then after 10 minutes, so this is the final dye injection, dye installation. So you can see that the vein is uh, properly visualized and ultimately there is no uh, uh, there is ultimately, uh, uh, means there is no leak. So the procedure was successful and patient was uh, shifted to the ICU for observation for uh, 24 hours. And after that, he was shifted to the ward. So after that, what are you going to do? So we gave them the option of a, uh, means a CAPD and uh, versus a uh, left-sided perm, left sided perm cath. So uh, patient was not at all willing for a, a CAPD. So after two weeks, we... Sorry, after one week, we did the uh, left sided perm cap. So, this you can see. So, we have uh, come via the left IJV and uh, put a uh, passed the guide wire into the right IJV, left uh, IVC. And uh, you can see the so you can see the catheter guide uh, means uh, sheath earlier, and uh, the catheter is going in, and you can see the final catheter. So, this is a left sided perm cap, what we did. So a uh, patient was discharged uh, two to three days after that, and uh, he is undergoing dialysis. Flows are quite good, and he hasn't had any issues so far. So to summarize, PERMCAT dysfunction is a PERMCATs are double-edged swords. So you can have an excellent dialysis quality because you can run the dialysis at uh, even 350, 400 ml per minute. However, if you are not taking care of it properly, you can have multiple issues like we saw earlier. Issues are more common than we, than we recognize because unless we uh, follow them up quite well, Quite often, you can see that if you don't uh, uh, means uh, uh, monitor them well, uh, we have perm cats running at 200 or not because there is some increased arterial, uh, uh, increased venous pressure or the flows are inadequate. So ultimately, if your uh, dialysis staff is not vigilant, uh, you can have issues and issues may happen anytime. So this was a, a procedure which should have been finished in and out in 20 minutes, but ultimately, uh, even after all this, which went on smoothly, uh, we had an issue. And uh, it is a and insertion should be ultrasound guided and preferably the procedure should be fluoro guided. So the sign there are signs of impending problems. So if you are having not having adequate flow in one limb or if your venous pressure is high or if your uh, dialysis uh, is breaking in between, then there it are signs that you are having a fibrin sheath or you are having a clot in there. Thrombosis can occur and so can fibrin sheath. Both are treatable if tackled early. And uh, you have to treat with respect. In a lot of units, the youngest and the most inexperienced staff take care of the catheters. That is not the way. Uh, the experienced and uh, neat staff should handle, and they should be handled neatly and responsibly. Locking so uh, solutions will help, but uh, the thing with uh, locking is that you have to lock with adequate volume. Otherwise, again, a thrombus formation can occur. And uh, antibiotic solutions, there are papers saying that uh, you have reduction in infections, but uh, uh, again, if you don't do it properly, again, you can have infections. And uh, uh, sometimes you can have multiple events occurring in the same shift or you can have multiple events uh, in the same day. So if such an event occur, it might not be your perm cath care. It might be something wrong with the water or it might be something wrong with your, uh, uh, means dialyzer reprocessing or something wrong with the solutions or something wrong with the heparin or whatever you are using. So you need to go back and analyze what is going wrong and then uh, do a root cause analysis. And with proper care and maintenance, you can make perm cats run for years. 
So, uh, so in the present case, uh, means uh, I have to thank Dr. Vinod and Dr. Jay Partham. So help me out with the case. Dr. Priya Darsini and Dr. Vishnu for giving me the uh, slides and uh, Dr. Pradeep Koshi because uh, some of the films I projected here are uh, were done by him. Thank you for a patient listening.